Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. A local man now a widow after his house caught on fire, taking the life of his wife last week. And that man also lost his pets and part of his livelihood. But now his neighbors are stepping up and asking for the community to help him get back on his feet. Our Alicia Barrera finds out what inspired them to help. You know, I wish I could have done more for her. We all say that when it's too late, unfortunately. 67-year-old Kathy Babin was well-known and well-loved by her neighbors. She was just a wonderful person. You know, she was outgoing and she was concerned about it everyone else. And while they miss her, they also want to help Babin's partner, Steve Garden. He lost his uh, house, his wife, his pets. Garden suffered burn injuries and smoke inhalation and also lost his prosthetic leg in the fire. We have a GoFundMe account. Um, we're also thinking about doing a barbecue fundraiser. Um, at a later date. And just days after that deadly fire, another loss for that survivor. Neighbors say that someone broke into the shed. He lost his job, all his tools and all of his power equipment. Through community donations, neighbors hope it will help cover Babin's funeral expenses, as well as help Garden quickly replace his prosthetic leg. It's hard, but you know, we can all pull together and we, we're here for Steve and that's all that matters. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. And following that fire, crews went back to check on neighbors there. They installed smoke detectors in several homes, including in Mr. Cortez's, to raise awareness and help prevent the future loss of any lives. We have new information about a human smuggling case from last week where 25 people were in the cargo area of a tractor trailer on the far west side. The arrest happened last Friday in the parking lot of a shopping center near Loop 410 and Highway 151. The arrest affidavit states one suspect, Christopher Cavazos, allegedly paid $800 to take those 25 people from Laredo to San Antonio. Another suspect, Fernando Castagnon, was paid $300 to make sure they made it to their destination once they made it to San Antonio. And the last suspect, Esmeralda Castillo, was approached in an HEB parking lot and asked to take seven undocumented immigrants to a different location once they arrived in San Antonio. She was going to be paid $1,050 for that job. All three suspects facing federal charges of conspiracy to transport undocumented immigrants. The San Antonio police need your help to find two suspects accused of robbery and shooting up a south side laundromat. This happened back on January 14th at the quick wash off of West South Cross. That's near Somerset Road in South Zarzamora. Police say the suspects met up with a man there to buy some items. The suspect allegedly refused to pay, got into a blue car. That's when one of the suspects allegedly opened fire. Anyone with any information asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. More than half a million dollars stolen from a Windcrest church by an employee who worked there for more than 30 years. Now that employee is going to prison for seven years for that crime. Lavelle Wilson pleaded guilty to theft and misapplication of fiduciary property from New Creation Christian Fellowship. Court records show that Wilson worked as the executive assistant to the bishop, assistant to the bishop rather. She was also in charge of two of the church's bank accounts. She took about $667,000. Court records show that she used the money for a trip to Hawaii, shopping sprees, upscale dining, personal loan payments, and more. The people living in a gated Alamo Ranch community frustrated after a broken gate led to a string of crime early Tuesday morning. Now, one of those exit gates stuck in the open position. That meant an open invitation to an unknown number of people entering that community and checking for unlocked car doors. People say the suspects got into several cars stealing a variety of items, and in at least one case, they stole the entire car. We don't have just um, unlimited pockets. We have worked hard. We have defended this country and we have earned everything that we have. And don't just come and take it, earn it yourself. This is Texas, people have weapons. It's not worth risking your life over. The Homeowners Association did release a statement saying they were aware of the situation with the gate and how much the gate will cost to fix. At this time, no arrests have been made. 
A man is recovering in the hospital after being hit by a moving train overnight on the northeast side. This happened around 2 a.m. near the intersection of Lookout Road and Topper Wine Road near Loop 1604. San Antonio police say the man was hit by a ladder on that train. A family member took him to a nearby hospital and then he was eventually transported to Bamsey. As staff, parents and students at a Southside Elementary School breathing a sigh of relief as a large grass fire got a little too close for comfort. Yeah, we first told you about this story yesterday. The staff there had to spring into action to get about 50 students <coughs> home safely. Our Erica Hernandez tells us what they learned from the situation. You started to smell it. The smell of smoke still lingers inside Gallardo Elementary. How many of you were, were scared? Students are now processing exactly what happened as some were still at school when smoke filled the area. So we wouldn't ask you to come to school if it wasn't safe, okay? And so I want you to know that when I got here, I wanted to make sure that everything was okay for you guys. The fire was just off Highway 281, and at first staff thought the fire wasn't nearby, but soon saw the flames. And within minutes, this fire spread and it got very close. Just to give you an idea, here is where the fire line ends, the school right across the street. It is scary. And um, even seeing like what that could have happened at any wrong move, that fire could have been here. Principal LeBon James and his staff worked quickly and calmly to evacuate students. Some even had to be driven by campus police to a nearby gas station. It wasn't just about our students, but it was about our entire Gallardo community. And to see everyone step up and take those coordinated efforts really shows what it means to, to be a supportive environment for our students and for our safety for everyone. Even though the fire is out, the fear of a repeat remains on their minds as there's a risk for potential fires tomorrow when gusty winds return. It's making sure that all safety protocols are implemented 100%, but then we provide additional safety measures to ensure everyone's well-being. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A horrific tragedy four years ago, turning into a platform for love and education. Erin Castro Rios was murdered by her boyfriend in 2018. And during Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, her family honoring her by serving others. As Courtney Freeman explains, a fundraising event this weekend will ensure other teens get to continue the life that Erin was on track to live. I've always said if it could happen to her, it could happen to anyone. That she'd speak up for herself, and someone else that needed it. Fearless, you know, she was spicy. Erin Rios Castro was murdered on her 19th birthday by her on and off again boyfriend, who was just sentenced to 35 years in prison for the murder and another 20 years for assaulting her years before. It starts out nice. It's a grooming process, I believe. Before Erin knew it, she was almost brainwashed. She wasn't the same Erin. The old Erin wouldn't have let somebody treat her the way she was being treated uh, towards the end. That's why Aaron's mom, Rena Castro, set aside her pain to create the Aaron Rios Castro Foundation, visiting schools to teach kids about dating violence and healthy relationships. You have a voice, use it, you know, and love yourself and know that you're worth it. And that you're not alone. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You're not alone. Get help. The foundation also gives out scholarships for teens that have been affected by domestic violence. Affected in any way, had it been yourself affected, a loved one, you know, maybe you've seen your parents or your neighbors or your aunt, uncle, cousin, friend. This Saturday is the annual 5K event that funds those scholarships and Rena hopes the public will come out to support the cause. We all want to help the next generation and the next group of girls. I see Erin and so many girls that I talk to and it, um, it breaks my heart, and I want them to break that chain. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And Saturday's run starts at 9 a.m. at Woodlawn Lake Park. Registration is at 8. Our Courtney Friedman emceeing that event. There will be community leaders out there, games, prizes, resource booths as well. To apply for that scholarship or register for the run, go to the Foundation's website. We have that link on KSAT.com. The property taxes going up is something a lot of San Antonio homeowners are used to. Property taxes going down, that's a different story. But the city could be forced into cutting its property tax rate. Garrett Berger joins us live from City Hall. All right, Garrett, when you talk about lowering taxes, you get a lot of people's attention. That's right, Steve, but don't go clicking your heels yet. When we're talking about cutting the property tax rate, which in all likelihood is not going to shrink your bill, it's just going to keep it from growing as much. 
At the root of this is a 2019 state law that limits cities to getting ju just three and a half percent more property tax revenue than they did the year before. Any more than that triggers an automatic election on the tax rate. Now the city is facing that possibility and rather than face an election, likely just going to cut its rate. Now, so some basics, your property tax bill is based both on the value of your home and the tax rates that entities like the city, county, or your local school district set. In San Antonio, it's those skyrocketing property values that have driven the constantly rising tax bills. And city, city staff suspect that appraisals for this year could grow enough to bump the city up against that 3.5% cap for the first time since it was put in place. If so, the city could end up lowering its tax rate to keep revenues under that limit, a cut that could happen this summer as the city council considers the 2023 budget. Well, we'll be working with the Bear County Appraisal District between now and July 25th on the certified roll. As we get those values in, then we'll make a determination if that rate um, needs to be cut. There is a possibility as we basically come out of the pandemic, our expectation is that property values on the commercial side will begin to rise. Now, if the city does take this step, it would count towards your tax bill for 2022. That's the one you pay between October and January of 2023. Now, it's only for the city portion of your bill, though. The county, school, school district, et cetera, set their own taxing rates, which also play into how much you pay. Now, at the same time, city council members are already discussing the possibility of increasing the homestead exemption, which could also lighten the load that you pay when it comes to tax time. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Something we will keep watching. Thank you, Garrett. The San Antonio International Airport is celebrating black history by putting up a new display that features information all about black cowboys. This display celebrates the history of Wilcox Ranch, the last operating black owned ranch in a Freeman's colony in Seguin, Texas. It tells the story of black cowboys, ranchers and landowners from that time period. Organizers say this is a great way to reach San Antonio residents and those traveling through to tell more about black history. Africans were accustomed to raising animals, horses, even before they arrived on these shores as slaves. So it was no wonder that once we arrived here on these shores, we were put in charge of a lot of the livestock there. Black history is American history. And what I know is if you see me in history, you know that I matter. When I see myself in history, I know that I matter. That display located in the Terminal A baggage claim, and it will be up through March. Yeah, this is almost a tale of two days. I mean, it was kind of cloudy, <laughs> overcast, a little rainy this morning. But man, did things change in a hurry. Yeah, they sure did. We had a little bit of drizzle earlier today and a few drops on our live cam earlier this morning. But then the sun came out and look what happened to temperatures. Still 75 degrees at the airport, but we had a high temperature of 80. And look at that dew point now, 61. We actually feel a bit of humidity back in the air, something we really haven't felt in quite some time. Uvalde 80 degrees, 81 Divine and Hondo, 82 Castroville, Stinson at 79, 72 Bernie, and you get into the 70s elsewhere. Relatively warm through the evening and overnight tonight. You really don't need a jacket, contrary to what we've been accustomed to. I mean, still near 70 at 10 o'clock and then just sitting in the 60s overnight. That bit of humidity, though, leading to some patchy drizzle. I don't think it'll have a big impact on the morning commute. One more warm day and then the cold front hits. We're going to talk about those changes in a bit. Thank you, Adam. One preschool taking learning to the great outdoors. Why they say students benefit more in a non-traditional classroom setting. Plus, a rodeo tradition continues, one that we look forward to every year. David Sears trying all the new foods out at the rodeo. He's going to show us what's on the menu. We'll have the roll aids ready for David. Plus, Trans Guide right now. This is 281 at Hildebrand. You can see pretty heavy in both directions, but no big traffic backups to tell you about at this hour.
I'm Stephanie Jimenez and we have a lot to discuss tonight on the Night Beat. Family members are revealing more now about a homicide case just southwest of San Antonio. Relatives say that Melissa Escobar was killed by her ex-boyfriend in Pearsall over the weekend. So we're asking how can victims of domestic violence get help in rural communities? We'll take a look at that tonight. Also, a new report shows that spending in the U.S. is up. So before you think about swiping those credit cards, experts want you to check your credit score. We're going to tell you more about how to raise that number. Plus this. So nice. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> hey, you're doing great. Look, you made it. I made it. Yeah, it's an adventure. You're going to go underground and into a cave cleaning operation. That site guides water to the Edwards Aquifer, which is where we get our drinking water. And tonight, we're going to take a look at what crews found there and how you can help keep it clean. We'll see you for those stories and so much more tonight on The Night Beat. Thank you, Stephanie. We got some late breaking news now I want to tell you about. We're learning about a drive by shooting where a teenager was shot. Yeah, that shooting happening on Beaver Lane that is near East Commerce and South New Braunfels Avenue. Here's what we know so far. A 13 year old has been shot in the leg. You can see it's a very active scene. This is a live picture from the ground at the site. The teen is being taken to the hospital with non life threatening injuries. As of now, police are telling our crews out there that they are still looking for a suspect. We'll stay on this and keep you updated on this developing story as we learn new information, both here on air and online. It is a tradition that can only happen at the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo, and it involves David Sears and good food. Oh, and as always, he is accompanied by this year's Miss Rodeo Texas. Take a look as they walk and eat their way through the food court. Welcome to the food court. Last year we missed out on this because of the pandemic and all that ice that we had and the big snowstorm. So this year we're making up for some lost food fun with, of course, Miss Rodeo Texas. Hi, I'm Bobby Loran, Miss Rodeo Texas, and we're about to have some fried food fun, San Antonio stock show and rodeo style. Bobby, we're going to start with some fried shrimp. You like cocktail sauce on yours? I do, I do. Mm. That's a good start, wouldn't you say? That's excellent. So if you don't like fried fish, we got something for you. <laughs> we got a fried PBJ, a classic delight anyone can enjoy. Did All you right. say, is it like ooey gooey? Ooey gooey goodness. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow. So we're going to try something a little traditional, but also non-traditional. So fries with garlic and Parmesan on them. <laughs> That's right. Ooh, that is oh, traditionally non-traditional. Look that at looks that. looks amazing. Oh. I'm going to get this pretty one right here. Mm. I've never heard a fry <laughs> described as pretty, but they are pretty good. <laughs> right? <laughs> After shrimp, PB&J, and fries, you got to have some dessert, right? Right. Nothing like a fried Oreo. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and of course, you have to finish off your trip to the food court with a funnel cake. Oh, who needs a fork? <laughs> Come on. That's an excellent funnel cake. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Another successful tour. Cheers. Cheers. David Sears. Bobby Loran, KSAT 12 News. I think Bobby's got a future. <laughs> you know, I was telling you guys about going out there to the carnival the other day. Yeah. Cold. I wanted the funnel cake. The four year old won the snow cone. All that just made me hungry. 50 degree snow cone. It's 50 degree snow yeah, cone. Kids. It, but he loved it. You tried to talk him into a funnel cake and I he did. said no? Yeah. And we obviously wow. should have just gotten both, but you know. Yeah. I guess Kasky, I have to go again. Your go to out there? Oh, you know, there's. What's it called? It was one of the booths David was at, but it's. um. It's a, it's the barbecue Sunday. So it's got like coleslaw, beans, oh. and uh, pulled pork all layered on. Oh, and you wow. Just scoop it out. That it's actually sounds amazing. Right? <laughs> and that's Welcome. what we would need the roll aids for. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> Extra. Or tums or whatever. <laughs> Extra I, strength, know, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. Today we started off at 58 degrees, and then this afternoon we hit 
80 here in the Alamo City and even warmer in outlying areas. The record high today, 87. That was set back in 1927. Of course, both low and high, well above average. Look at Catula, 90 degrees the high. Pleasanton topped out at 86 along with Del Rio. All right, let's get a look at what's happening outside at the moment, what temperatures are going to do and how they respond to our next cold front. Still warm south and west of town. I mean, 87 Catula, Carrizo Springs, 82. Del Rio still in the 80s. Elsewhere, we have some 70s and east of I-35. This is where the clouds have really hung on the longest and in turn temperatures not as warm. Lower 70s, so New Braunfels 72 along with Gonzales, Beeville, Victoria 71. The cold front or the cooler air that's going to make its way here is off to the north of us and temperatures behind it, yes, are noticeably cooler. I mean, North Platte, Nebraska 29 single digits and teens in North Dakota and parts of Minnesota. We're not going to get hit by the core of the cold air, but we'll get clipped by it and it's going to affect our temperatures, especially the, in the coming mornings. Now tomorrow morning, a warm start to the day right near 60. OK, so a warm night, unseasonably warm, mild day to the mild start to the day tomorrow and then Friday and Saturday mornings right near freezing. We're thinking about 33 degrees to start the day on Friday and Saturday. Of course, probably a light freeze in several outlying areas. I also want to talk about the change in mugginess. So we have a bit of humidity out there right now. You feel that hint of humidity back in the air, something we haven't had a whole lot of over the past several weeks. This is going to be brief. It's going to last through the night, give us some patchy drizzle, but then get swept away early tomorrow morning and very low humidity tomorrow all the way through the weekend. But tomorrow that dry air combines with a gusty wind. In turn, we have the red flag warning in effect. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have a bunch of red flags, OK? It just means that there's higher fire danger. So in the event that a fire develops, a grass fire or a structure fire, the weather could rapidly spread that fire. That's what that red flag warning is. So combination of very low relative humidity and some gusty winds, probably some wind gusts about 30 to 35 tomorrow throughout the day. All right, here's the big picture. So we have that cold front to the north, another system that's moving in in the upper levels over the Rockies. And then as that upper level wind crosses over the Rockies and hits the plains, it stirs up a new low, low pressure system here at the ground. And that's going to happen over North Texas and Oklahoma tonight through tomorrow night. And that's where the action is going to be. So the moisture associated with this next system pretty much all to the north of us just a 10 percent chance of a stray shower around here tomorrow night but that could even cause some severe weather from about San or Abilene to Dallas all the way up to Oklahoma City and Tulsa that's where the threat for severe weather is with that system around here really not much for moisture just a noticeable wind tomorrow another breezy day northwest steady at 10 to 20 gusting between 30 and 40 near 80 for the high temperature more specifically you get south and west of town will make it into the lower 80s again not as warm as today but still unseasonably warm, warmer than average. And in the hill country, uh, as that cool front drops in, you won't be quite as warm. We'll see temperatures in the upper 60s tomorrow. Upper 50s by Friday, then this weekend, we're back in the 60s with a slight chance of a few showers by Monday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, there are some San Antonio kids who are getting ready for draft day. <laughs> and they're all doing it, it seems together. Yes, and Sierra McCormick, DeMarvin Leal up in the Frisco area working out at Exos. It's a company that helps young men like them get ready for the next level. So we had a chance to go up there and talk about the two guys, look at them, goofing off with each other, a little break in the action for them. Plus, while we were up there, we also had a chance to talk to Sincere about opting out of the Roadrunners Bowl game. Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Judson Grace, DeMarvin Leal, and Cecilia McCormick are up in Frisco getting ready for the NFL Scouting Combine with the goal of improving every aspect of their game and their draft stock. The two are training at Exos, who specializes in sports training for professional athletes. The two Judson Rockets are on the same NFL draft together, which is pretty darn cool. It's exciting, you know, I haven't seen him in three years, so, you know, I mean, we had our experience at, at Justin High School, but just to be around him, you know, he's still the same guy from high school, still goofy as ever, you know, and just chopping it up with him. Me and Cecil, we, you know, first on varsity, first freshman on varsity high school, so it's like, sounds about right, you know, we go into stuff together, we come out of it together. Same thing as in high school, we started um, 
uh, varsity early, you know, as freshmen. So, you know, it's basically to start all over again. Now we're doing it with the NFL. So it's great to have a guy like him around me. Did you guys talk about this growing up, going to the NFL one day? You know, we always, we all have always had that dream, you know, just being able to compete against each other, play with each other, and just, just as a whole, just being able just to be out the, throughout this process. NFL scouting combine runs March the 1st through the 7th at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, and the NFL draft is April 28th through the 30th in Las Vegas. Now, going to Exos also gave us our first chance to talk with Sincere about opting out of the Roadrunners Bowl game and declaring for the NFL draft. Sincere went to Frisco for the Bowl week because it was very important for him to support his teammates while they supported him. Sincere, who says the decision wasn't an easy one, talked with Coach Trailer, who gave him some great advice. I had a conversation with him, we talked about it, and you know, um, some of the guys on the team, I you know, also spoke to them as well. Um, my decision making had to you know, deal with, mostly I have a daughter, so I had to go feed her, and a lot of people on the team understood that, and my coach understood, understand, understood that too as well, and, and uh, you know, as, he, as you see, he was seeing me beating myself up because he knew how bad I wanted to be there for my team. And, and he knew the decision I was making. He said, if, you, if you're going to make your decision, live with it. You know, don't look behind because you look behind and you start second guessing yourself. You know, make, your, make your decision right and just live with it at, at the end of the day. And that he is. And check it out, former UTSA offensive lineman Spencer Burford from Wagner High School is also training Exos to prepare for the NFL scouting combine. The Spurs will continue the rodeo road trip tonight at the Oklahoma City Thunder. Then they'll get eight days off due to the All-Star game. Sharp shooter Doug McDermott is excited for the new Spurs to play, including Josh Richardson. He's a really good player. Um, he's been around the league for a while. Um, really good defender and uh, can shoot the ball. So he's a good addition to our team. Um, I think Romeo is as well. Um, I think he's a good young player that you know can use more of an opportunity. So hopefully, hopefully he can get that um, at some point. And you know I think um, I think the moves they made were good. And Thomas is a really good uh, locker room guy and really gotten to know him in the last couple of days. So just excited to have those guys here. Here is your matchup Spurs at the Thunder tonight at seven o'clock and I saw online that the Thunder will be down at least six players tonight. So go Spurs go. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. COVID injuries, whatever. It didn't say it just said that they were going to be out at least six yeah. players. So <laughs> they better win this yes. game. That's what <laughs> yeah, you're we'll saying. Yeah. It. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. Our case at Q&A is next. All this week, we are focusing on the race for Bear County Judge, talking to the candidates throughout the week about why they're in the race and priorities for the county if elected. We talked to Peter Sakai on Monday, Judge Peter Sakai yesterday, Representative Ina Minjares on Friday, former County Commissioner Trish DeBerry, and today we have Isalise Mesa Gonzalez, who is running for County Judge. You have served as the Chief of Staff for Mayor Ron Nirenberg. So thank you so much for being here, and let's talk First thing off the bat, why are you in this race? Thank you for having me. Um, I'm in this race because I am born and raised here in San Antonio, Texas, and I grew up in a family dedicated to public service. Uh, my parents taught me how to value public service, how to work hard every day, and to always um, have the courage to stand up to do what's right. Uh, my husband and I are now raising our two children here in San Antonio. I'm invested in this community. Uh, San Antonio runs through my, my veins. And um, I am committed to serving this community. I've taken every opportunity I can to serve, uh, whether it was serving on the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women, Healthy Futures of Texas Boards, and the Martina Street Women's Center. And most recently, I think in, in my public service job as Chief of Staff to the Mayor. So as county judge, I want to lead Bear County into the future, uh, build strong families and bring people together to make Bear County a safe and better place to live. Eva Lise, why you've never run for elected office before, I don't think. I wasn't able to find it anyway. No. Why county judge? Why did you decide this is a race I'm going to jump into? So I think it's an opportunity for our community to vote again for the leader for the next generation of Bear County residents. I saw firsthand working in the mayor's office uh, what it meant to have a strong local government and coordination between our local governments, that being the county government and our city government. 
Um, I saw this as an opportunity, just as another opportunity, opportunity to serve my community. Um, this is the first time in 20 years that we've had an open seat for this position. Most people, I know for me um, specifically, the only county judge I'm familiar with is, is Judge Nelson Wolf. Um, and so this is an opportunity for our community to, to vote for that next leader. Um, and I hope they choose me to be their, their, their county judge. Talk a little bit about what you believe that your work as chief of staff for the mayor really can, can give this position. You, you talk about the coordination between the city and the county, and that's certainly been on display for two years now. Uh, so what do you think that you've learned in this position as chief of staff that would benefit the judge position? So the county judge's role, and I think it's important to understand the role of the county judge, the, the county judge is the executive of the county government. Um, I would sometimes describe it to voters as the mayor of the county. Um, so my executive experience serving as chief of staff to that mayor is what I want to bring to our county government. I spearheaded the mayor's response to the COVID. Uh, so we focused on public education. We saw us every day on the news at 6.15 p.m. Um, we focused on community outreach and had an aggressive strategy to get vaccines throughout our, our city. Um, we also in initiated a sales tax uh, election, moving our uh, sales tax dollars from our Edwards Aquifer to workforce development, and then finally to our VIA transportation system in perpetuity. So that's another initiative that I, I took on, um, and we were successful in our sales tax elections. Uh, before COVID, we had various economic and workforce development projects that we were rolling out with the city, also with the county. So I think that experience in local governments um, is, is what I want to bring to our county government. I think the number one requirement for a county judge and something that I take very uh, seriously is that continued collaboration between the city and county. Uh, we need to ensure that there are no duplication of efforts. Um, and that our resources are properly distributed uh, for the sake of the taxpayer. Talk I also think, go ahead. Oh, I, I, was, I was just gonna move on, sorry, I, I thought you were, my apologies. Sure. I, I, one of the big issues that certainly the sheriffs have had to deal with over the many years, Sheriff Salazar and others, as well as the county commissioners and of course the county judge, has been the jail, the Bear County Jail. The conditions there, uh, there have been some failed inspections there, the overtime issue. How would you deal with the Bear County Jail and the overtime issue? So that's been an issue that's been plaguing our community for as long as I can remember. I mean, we've heard that time and time again, um, issues with overtime. So we need to, I wanna work with the, the sheriff, uh, collaborate with the sheriff and make sure that we build a strong edu uh, agency that is dedicated to retention and recruitment of our uh, deputies, um, assistant deputies. So really it's, it's working with the sheriff and, and going kind of leaning into what the department has dealt with um, and understanding the issues and, and not just with the sheriff, but also with the deputies and with the folks that are working in the jail. It's a tough job. Um, I, I will never uh, say that it's not. Um, and those folks that are working in those jail systems are providing for their families. So they go home to their families and their families also take on some of that pressure from the job at home, just like most of us do. When we get home, we talk about work and kind of the stress that we have with work. And so we wanna make sure that our employees are, are ha get the resources they need to do their job well. Um, and are not overworked. Um, a lot of times when there's overtime, there's also uh, burning out because we're just, you know, employees are overworked. And so talking with employees um, and understanding what the issues are is, is a priority for me. Ivalice Mesa Gonzalez, candidate for Bear County Judge. Thank you for being here with us this evening. We do want to mention if somebody wants to rewatch our Q&A with you or any of the other candidates that we are sharing some time with this week, you can find that on ksat.com. I also think it's very appropriate that you bumped your former boss. You know, Ron <laughs> Nuremberg is usually in this, uh, in this spot, and so we bumped him for you, so you have bragging rights there. Don't tell him. <laughs> Ivalice Mesa Gonzalez, thank you for your time. We'll be right back.
A local preschool focuses on learning outside the classroom from growing food in a garden to taking care of farm animals. Yeah, Sarah Costa visited with the Lily Pad Farm School to learn about the preschool's mission and talk to some of the students. From goats, baby bulls, and chickens to a garden that cultivates food by the seasons, the Lily Pad Farm School emphasizes learning outside with nature. The school's owner, Lily Arguello, says there are about 250 students from infant to six years old who don't just learn inside the classroom, but spend a lot of their time either learning to plant seeds in the garden or feeding farm animals. Nature is part of our world, right? I mean, without that, none of us would be here. So it's really important for kids to kind of get down to the basics and learn how to grow food, learn how to care for animals, and be self-sustainable. Here on the farm, they have about 12 large animals and about 25 small ones, including Magnolia here, who's three months old. The farm animals have such a vital component in the success of the crops, and there's so much learning experience that goes into the farm animals themselves. Six-year-old Camden says he loves feeding the animals, especially when the pig Wilbert visits the farm. Wilbert. Wil oh, the pig? Uh-huh. What noise does Wilbert make? <laughs> Today's garden activity included tilling the soil and planting for the spring. Three-year-old Vivian says she likes watching the plants grow big. What do you do use the soil for? To grow. To grow what? Tomatoes. But it's the animals for six-year-old Eliana and the main reason she loves her school. We get to learn and see the animals. Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Saw some pretty big weather changes just in one day here today. So, of course, we're going to talk about some more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's always changing out there for us. And actually, tonight's going to be a unseasonably warm night, relatively speaking. It's going to be a well above average by about 15 degrees. So another warm day tomorrow, continued breezy tomorrow with a drop in the humidity. And that means the higher fire danger. So you get the red flag warning that you see on your phone or you hear about. That just means that if there's a fire that starts like a grass fire or a structure fire, the weather can rapidly spread that fire much cooler than as we get into Friday and not as much of a breeze. So let's talk temperatures and what's going on and what's headed our way. 75 right now after a high temperature of 80 degrees. But look at that dew point 61. You notice a bit of humidity in the air right now. That mugginess from that wind that's been coming off of the Gulf of Mexico. It's been quite a change over the past well, not just several days, but several weeks, we've had a lack of real noticeable humidity. West of I-35, you don't notice it, but locally and east, closer to the Gulf Coastline, you definitely have that hint of humidity. But tomorrow, it's swept away. We're going to have a wind kick in out of the northwest around sunrise. That's going to get rid of that mugginess and any drizzle associated with it overnight. And then dry air in place through the weekend. Little hint of humidity back in the air by Monday of next week. But let's talk temperatures. Catula made it to 90 earlier today, now 87. We're cooler though in the lower 70s where the clouds really held tight. You didn't get as much sunshine and you didn't have the opportunity to warm up from the sun. So Gonzales, New Braunfels, Kerrville, lower 70s right now, and those clouds held tight farther to the east. I mean, even Houston cooler than us at 68. There's the cold front to the north. Guyman, Oklahoma right now at 52 degrees. You look Farther north behind that front in the core of the cold air and temperatures in the teens and single digits across parts of North Dakota and northern Minnesota. That's where the core of the cold air is. We're just going to get clipped by the edge of that cooler air. So tomorrow morning, an unseasonably warm start to the day. I mean, we're talking 50s to near 60 degrees. So well above average for morning temperatures, not really a chill in the air to start the day. And by the afternoon, most of us well into the 70s, even just briefly hitting 80 degrees. The exception will be in the hill country where we'll be in the upper 60s. But look what happens on Friday. We drop back down into the 50s for most of Friday afternoon, a high temperature briefly about 59. But then we quickly rebound again, just like the last cold front temperatures rebounding again. So this upcoming weekend, Highs well into the 60s, which is actually pretty close to average for this time of year. And if you like these 80 degree days, they're going to be back 
Tuesday of next week. I think we'll get into the 80s again. Starting to see that transition to some warmer air creeping back into the forecast and into our neck of the woods. Here's a big dip in the upper level flow that's crossing over the southern Rockies right now. And as that goes into the Texas Panhandle in Oklahoma, it's going to help stir up a storm system and that surface low pressure system is going to cause widespread showers and thunderstorms mainly late tonight and on into early tomorrow morning far to the north of us and even I should say tomorrow night for the most part in parts of North Texas and Oklahoma not necessarily tonight but tomorrow night off to the north of us and there could be some severe thunderstorms North Texas and Oklahoma around here just an isolated shower possible about a 10 percent chance and that's pretty much it. Otherwise, take a look at the temperatures and how they change again. Near freezing Friday morning and Saturday morning. Those will be our low points. The coolest of the forecast. Otherwise, we're going to be warmer than that. OK, thank you, Adam. The buzz is up next. In the buzz today, scientists say that they have created a robotic fish that swims like the heart beats. Harvard University researchers teamed up with Emory University researchers to create the first fully autonomous biohybrid fish. This artificial fish was made from human heart cells. The scientists believe this technology will help them study heart conditions like arrhythmia and could one day lead to them being able to build an artificial heart. Much more than just a fish. All right, well, after two years, Coachella is back. Organizers say there will be no mask or vaccine requirements. The April Music Festival in Southern California usually draws more than 100,000 people per day. This year's headliners, Billie Eilish, Harry Styles, and Kanye West. And Stagecoach, another South Southern California Music Festival, also announced Tuesday that it would forego requirements for masks, vaccinations, and testing. We'll be right back. That is all of our time here on the News at 6. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here on the Night Beat at 10. Until then, have a great night.